hand clap of praise and thank you for another opportunity to be in the house tonight. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. Thankful for the hand of protection upon each and every one of us these past few weeks. I know a lot of people's going through a lot of stuff right now. And we're going to start tonight with prayer. We'll remember them. And if anybody else has any prayer request tonight, just let it be made known by the raising of your hand. The Lord knows each and every one of them. Let's start off tonight. Just give him some glory and some praise. Go right into these prayer requests. Can we do that? Lord, we give you praise tonight. We magnify you. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be in this house. To praise you, Lord, for your hand of mercy and grace upon each and every one of us. But God, we're asking tonight, and we know that there's a many people, God, that sick and afflicted. God, a lot of diseases, a lot of sickness that's going around. But I know, God, that you're the God that healeth us, that protects us, that keeps us. I pray, God, that you touch and move upon every situation. God, that was mentioned tonight, no matter what the situation may be, physical, spiritual, mental, God, financial, whatever the need is, God, I know you can handle it. God, you're the God that created us, and you're the God that can keep us. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you move in this place tonight. Bless the hearts and the minds of this people. Strengthen them, encourage them, and lift them up. And we give you all praise and honor, and we thank you for one more chance, God, to hear your word. One more chance to magnify you. One more chance to choose to lift up the name that is above every name. And we give you all praise and honor tonight, Lord, in that mighty, holy name of Jesus. And the church said, Amen. Let's give him a hand clap of praise and thank him tonight.
Amen. He is worthy of all the praise we can give. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the house tonight. I was thinking today and I went through some scriptures and I had a scripture that I wrote down. I even think I might have posted it on Facebook. I don't remember, but it's Romans chapter 8, 37 through 39. And it says, nay, and all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. That lists everything, Brother Shannon. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. What a powerful truth to know. That no matter how big of a knucklehead we've been in life, no matter how many failures we've made, no matter the situation that life has handed us, we do know that we cannot be separated from the love of God. Amen. That when I lift my voice and I begin to magnify him, and I begin to thank him and praise him, he's right there. Amen. What a powerful truth that is. One more time, let's just give him a hand clap of praise and thank him for that promise. Thank him that we know that he'll never leave us and never forsake us. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. At this time, we're going to give him a chance to give. Sister Hyde, if you could put the ways to give up. We have GiveLify and PayPal available at RiverbendPentecostals.com. You can also send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals. P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. You can bring your offering up here tonight, the wooden pans, and your tithe to the gold pans. And at this time, we're going to say this prayer. Amen. Y'all, I don't know about the rest of you, but I like this prayer. Amen. Keeps us focused and unified on the same purpose. Amen. Amen. Brother Tay, it's something that keeps our mind in the same place. And I know some people might not like it. Some people might really like it. But obedience to it and obedience to the Word of God changes the situation. Amen. So I want to be like him. And I want to be obedient, amen. So if you will, tonight, let's everybody, if you can, let's stand. And we're going to say this prayer tonight. And say it with some authority. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither, and I give my offerings. And I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out. And all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what God has blessed you with tonight.
Amen. So on Facebook yesterday, it said, a many, many times in history, Brother Billy, has a baby become a king. But only one time has a king ever become a baby. Right. Amen. And we know him, don't we? Yeah. And I'm glad he's in the house tonight. Amen. Yeah. Let's give him a hand clap for praise and thank you for his spirit that is so prevalent in this place tonight. The Lord is here and I'm thankful for what I feel in the house. Amen. Yeah. You may be seated. If we can get Riverbend kids to come. We'll let them go back. Man, we had a good-looking crowd last week. I know a lot of sickness and stuff going on. A lot of people battling this old crud or whatever you call it. And I'll be looking forward for when everybody's back. Amen? Amen. All right. Amen. All righty, y'all can head on back. Amen. That's a good group of kids right there. They are precious. I'm thankful for them. Amen. Thankful for the opportunity to go back there. They'll humble you sometimes. They sure will. All right. River Bend ignited. Give them a chance to go back. Here's a good looking bunch of young people right here. Amen. Thankful for each and every one of them. Brother Richard's got his hands full in the back. And I am thankful for every one of you. Amen. amen. God bless you. Y'all going to preach with pastor tonight. Amen. amen. All right. Amen. I sure hope so. It sure
How about now? I don't like it, but I can do it. But I like to have my hand. I can't talk without moving my hands. So we'll just, I don't know what the deal is. I ain't got no mute. I ain't got no mute button on this. Not brand new. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe something wrong on the module. It's all right. Let's get into the word. Um, so what you do is you read into chapter 6 at least next for next week. Just a word to the wise. Read a couple ahead. 6 and 7, maybe 8, and then back up and catch 6 again. Because uh, this ain't no class that you just get an A and pass. This is a class you're going to have to be taking for the rest of your life. What do y'all think about it so far? I think it's one of the best things I've ever come across uh, for my own life, for my own life. Last week we talked about Joseph and his process and how God was positioning him physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to bring his dreams to pass, which was actually the plan of God. They weren't Joseph's dreams. It was God's vision. And how he positioned him. And I don't want you to ever forget that Joseph was no more blessed outside of prison than he was in prison. Okay? But that wasn't his destiny. And uh, that was for somebody in particular. I don't know who. If I was, I'd let you know. That was for some folks in particular. And we talked about David and his process. David thought he was positioned in the perfect place. He's made it to the palace, and he's playing a harp for Saul and helping him. He's right in the perfect position to be mentored by Saul and to grow up into the king that God wanted him to be, but he was wrong. His perfecting process included being on the run from a vengeful enemy, one whose love, hear me now, somebody hear this, David desired the love of Saul. He craved the approval of Saul, but he couldn't get it. He didn't have just one, but two opportunities to take things into his own hands. And he could have said, it's the will of God and everybody would have bought it. Matter of fact, remember Abishai tried to tell him, God delivered him into your hands, man. What's wrong with you? Okay. David said, uh-uh. You know why? God help me right now. Hey, I felt a lot of Holy Ghost in the singing, and it ain't died down. Okay? It ain't died down. But the principles of God ain't changing for your circumstances. And if it looks like God's moving and it violates his word, you better tell the devil, quit trying to be a copycat. Because that's what's happened. Is the enemy's moved in trying to make you think it's God. Oh, I believe it's going to let the horses run again tonight. David had not one, but two opportunities where he could have took Saul out. And I don't think anybody would have ever known that he violated the law of God because David was anointed king, but he refused to bow down. Here's what he did. He left it up to God. Can everybody say that? Get that down in your gizzard. Get that in your melon, sinking in. I'm going to have to let God be God. David could not understand what he had done to receive such treatment at the hands of Saul. He couldn't understand it. But it's another glimpse into the heart of God, which we see, aside from Jesus Christ, we see the heart of God more clearly in David than we do anybody else. He was a man after God's own heart. That's what that means. All right, that's what that means. And the heart of God says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Lean not to thine own understanding. There wasn't a reason. David had nothing he could say. I did this and this is why Saul hates me. Remember, David did not have the benefit that we do of 2020 hindsight. 
Brother Blake, often we miss out on the journey that these people went through because we know what happens in the end. So we say, well, if I knew what was going to happen like that, I, if, if it was going to happen to me like it did to David, I could handle that. I read something today. I'm not sure. I think it was on Yahoo or on Facebook, one or the other. But it talked about some uh, um, mice that were put in some wa uh, cups of water, and they had to tread water. And they let them tread, I think it was like, I, I don't remember, a minute or two, they tread water. And they, they saved them at the last second, Brother Ronnie. And they dried them all off and they set them up here. And then they put them back in the water. And you know how long they were able to tread water the second time? 60 hours. You know what that says? Ooh, Holy Ghost. If you think there's hope, you won't ever give up. If you think there's hope, you won't ever give up. Oh, David had to live through having to trust God when nothing made sense. Nothing made sense in his life. He did nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. But yet, somehow in the middle of his dilemma, David received revelation and direction from God. He be, was becoming the man after God's own heart. He was able to discern. Everybody say discern. discern. That's something you better get in your gizzard too. He's able to discern that Saul's army wasn't put to sleep for David to destroy them. They were put to sleep for David's commitment to God to be tested. Would he, would he stay committed to obey God? Or would he give in to the flesh? And would he give in to the people around him? Would David settle? Would David settle for a kingdom established after the order of Saul, which was unrighteous? Or would he keep pressing to have a kingdom settled, established after the order of God, which was righteousness? As I said last week, David had to get it right. He had to get it right. The reason is David, whoo, David, man, y'all feel that in here? My goodness. David had to get it right because there was a destiny flowing through his royal lineage. Brother Blake, he was not the one supposed to be on the throne next. Jonathan was supposed to be on the throne next. But God took it away from Saul because he was a rebellious, disobedient, irreverent, uh, 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 egotistical maniac. And he took it away from him and he gave it to David. And it's through the lineage of David that the king of kings would be born and his kingdom to be established. Look in Matthew in the, 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 the genealogy of Jesus Christ and you'll find out that both Joseph and Mary were of the tribe of Judah of the bloodline of David. David had to get it right because Jesus was coming. Now let's look at this principle and how it's conveyed to us. Romans chapter 12, verse number 19. I'm going to stay here for a little bit, so be ready. In case you're wondering, got nine pages of notes tonight. Don't mean much. I can do nine pages in 30 minutes or I can do nine pages in three weeks. It's just all according to what the Lord's got going on. Dearly beloved, that's important. Dearly beloved. Who's he talking to in the book of Romans? Church folks. Got to get it. Got to get that. He's talking to believers. Talking to believers. Avenge not yourselves. Hmm. He puts no qualifiers on that. You know what I mean by qualifiers? Avenge not yourself. Except, there are no exceptions. Avenge not yourselves. But rather, don't avenge yourself. Don't look to get anybody back. That's what avenge is. Don't avenge yourselves. But rather, 
Conversely, the antithesis of avenging yourselves, give place unto wrath. That's the opposite of avenging ourselves, is give place unto wrath. So where is wrath's place? Where does wrath belong? With God. How do we know that? Where does it say that at? Does anybody know exactly? Can you take me to the word? How about James chapter 1, verse number 20? Wrath belongs in the hands of God. Because in my hands, it does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Because James chapter 1 and verse number 20 says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Period. Okay, you're not going to get the righteousness of God established by your anger, wrath, passion, zeal, etc. It's not going to happen. Oh, I'm going to preach a little bit right now, but I'm just going to put it in grandma and go slow. In my hands, it does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And that is my goal. The righteousness of God, not the righteousness of me. Not what I think's right, but the righteousness of God. And Brother Shannon, I've got to be willing to be wrong on what I think so he can be right. For it is written, vengeance is mine. That's the Lord. Vengeance is mine. Vengeance belongs to him. Vengeance, hear me. Vengeance means vindication, vengeance, full, complete punishment. He said, vengeance is mine. Now, what goes without saying when he said vengeance is mine? He is not saying, don't worry about it, I'll get him back. We want it to say that. When he says vengeance is mine, we want it to say, Sister Maria, you don't worry about them, I'm going to take care of them. That's not what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. If, if vengeance is necessary, it will be determined by him and enacted by him. Are you hearing me? Are you willing to let God decide if they need to be paid back or not? Well, I think we might be walking in high cotton right now. Uh huh. That's right. Trouble is, Sister Rita, we should be doing all this. We shouldn't even really have to teach this, but we got a problem. Our flesh and our spirit collide. We have a collision. And because we don't, Brother Shannon, take time out. Pause. Wait a minute. I'm fixing to hit that in just a second. The reason why we've got to teach this is because we've got to learn what the will of the Spirit is and learn to surrender to it. And I believe, Sister Rita, that we can get to a place where it works like that all the time. Anybody agree with me? I, I, that's why you teach this. That's why you teach this. Look at here. He said, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now here's what's going to be hard to swallow. Our journey through the bait of Satan, through holiness, and all the other Bible studies that I've got going in my mind, I could really start having church about four nights a week, teach a different series every night. Things the Lord has led me to. Our journey, everybody say our journey. our journey. You know what that means? We're going somewhere. We're not going through the motions. We're not just being religious, but we're on a journey. We're going somewhere. Our journey will end 
in a place where when this scenario comes alive, where rather than us praying, Father, get them back for me, we will pray, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the caveat to all of this is the Lord says if they need to be got, I'll be the one to get them. But Brother Shannon, I've got to go to a place where I'm willing, God help me, Holy Ghost, where I'm willing to stand in the gap for somebody that's done me wrong, where I'm willing to beg for mercy for somebody that's done me wrong, where I'm willing to ask God to take a chance on somebody who's done me wrong. And if it happens, we'll pray for their strength and for the mercies of God to be tempered in that necessary vengeance. Listen to this, what Helps Word Study says about vengeance. It says, judgment which fully executes the core values of the judge. Understand this. This vengeance only this vengeance is not in the plan of God so that he can get brownie points with you by getting your enemies back for you. This vengeance has one purpose. And that is to bring about the will of God. That is to bring us in alignment with the will of God. That's what the, this vengeance is not so you can sleep easier because God took your enemy out. We want it to be like that. We want it to say, I'm going to trust the Lord because I know there ain't no way he's letting them get away with that. That's how we read that. Truth is, it ain't got nothing to do with that, Brother Blake. It's got to do with two things. Me being in the will of God and them coming to the will of God. No, it doesn't. It's His. It belongs to Him. And it will be, look at that. It is something, judgment that is handed out. Let me read it again. Judgment which fully executes the core values are standards of that particular judge. So the vengeance that comes from God is to establish his will and what he wants, not to get somebody back because they did you wrong. I thought this bait of Satan stuff was to stop me from taking the bait and the Lord was going to whoop everybody that's been mean to me. Surprise. No, it's to make us all better. It's to make us all more like Jesus so we can be as effective as he was in his world, in our world. Bait of Satan says, It is righteous for God to avenge his servants. It is unrighteous for God's servants to avenge themselves. Taking matters into our own hands feels good and it even feels right initially. The question is, this ain't from the bait of Satan, this is from the mind of G. Money L. How can God trust me with that which I haven't seen or experienced with regard to revival, with regard to fulfilling his word? How can he trust me with that which I haven't experienced if he can't trust me with that which I have. This is plain. Everybody under the sound of my voice has been offended. And Brother Shannon, we learned way back in the beginning of this that they're going to keep on coming. Offense is coming. Me being offended ain't a done deal.
How can God trust me with that which I want, that I dream of, that I envision, if I won't do right with what he's already given me? How? That's Bible. That's Bible. I preached a message one time that, that the book of Jeremiah says, how can you expect to run with the horses when you can't run with the footmen? How do you expect to run with the big dogs if you can't get off the porch? Everybody all right? We're going to get into some touchy stuff right now, but I ain't scared. How can God use corrupt or messed up leaders? Saul chased David. For 14 years. In his anger and frustration. Because Doeg. The tattletale. Murderous. Wannabe. Told that the priest. Gave David Goliath's sword. And fed him. The shoe bread. Saul sent Doeg down there and he killed 85 members of the priesthood. How many people have fallen prey to our unrighteous anger and frustration as we pursued David? Why was Saul, oh, help me right now, Holy Ghost, why was Saul chasing David? Oh, yeah, that's true. But in the context of this lesson, why was Saul chasing David? He got offended. He thought, he thought David had done him wrong. Because he heard the young, oh Lord, he heard the young ladies singing, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands, and his mind went to work. His mind went to work, and he thought David had done him wrong, undercutting me. He's out. Here we go. Little sap sucker wasn't nothing till I brought him to the palace. Now he walks around here like a little bainy rooster with his with his chest stuck out and his head lifted up, and they're singing songs about him. He knows I'm the king, but he just lets him. David, it had nothing to do with that stupid song. But Saul thought he was offended. Oh, what a tragedy. He missed out on this young man was submitted to him completely. He'd been anointed, Brother Blake. He didn't ask for that anointing. He wasn't asking to be made king. He was submitted completely to Saul. Look what Saul missed out on. Because he thought. He made a misconception. And now Saul's been chasing David for 14 years onto something in his mind. Hundred percent, hundred percent. We just decide. That's what the First Corinthians chapter ten says: the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to pulling down the strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing, because our mind exalts itself against what we know to be true of God, and we make decisions for other people what they think. We decide we know what they think, ladies and gentlemen. Can I introduce you to what it means to play God? When you think you can read the mind of everybody around you, that's what Saul was doing. And in the, oh, Holy Ghost, help me. In the meantime, he ran off the greatest asset God ever gave him. It's ironic, exactly. It's a paradox. But 
I, I think we mentioned that a few weeks ago. Saul refused to kill the enemy, but tried to kill his friend. That's right. That's right. Oh, I'm not going to preach this just yet, but I'm fixing to preach it in a few weeks. Not only did he decide he didn't need God, he decided he didn't need the man of God. Because Samuel didn't come when Saul wanted him to, so Saul built an altar and made a sacrifice, and the Lord said, right then, I'm done with that rascal. Okay? Saul believed he had been offended. He believed that David was trying to sway people his way because of a stupid song he heard. We don't read anything in Scripture that turns Saul against David except that one little tune. He never did one thing against him, Brother Blake. Not one thing. Uh -huh. So he was probably jealous because he was getting happy and then when he opened up singing that song and it was just all blown up. Yeah. Yeah, he's out of the will of God. Yeah. Done walked away from the presence of the Lord. He decided he was smarter than God. Because yeah. when Samuel showed up, Sister Nadine, he said, what's that lowing of the oxen and stuff I hear? He said, didn't the Lord tell you to kill everything? And Saul says, well, I did exactly what he told me to do. Yeah. yeah. He said, I did exactly what he told me to. Yeah, I killed them all. Well, what's, what do you mean these oxen and stuff I hear lowing? He said, oh, I brought the best back. Brother David talks about it a lot. Brother Chipwood, I believe, maybe preached it. Maybe it was Brother David that taught it. The insanity of sin. That's what happens. Your mind gets whacked out. And you no longer think clearly. When you become intoxicated with your own victimization and you become intoxicated with your own vindication and nothing matters in the world except being proved right, even when you're wrong. God can and will use unrighteous and corrupt leaders to perfect us. But our willingness to trust God will be put to its greatest test when we have to submit ourselves to somebody who we don't believe is right. Say, I don't think God works like that. You ain't read the book. You ain't read the book. Oh, I hit a little clunker right there. Don't you get caught up in CNN and Fox and CBS and ABC and all of that and forget that the word says you're supposed to pray for the president that's up there. Oh, goodness. Say, oh, you're being political. No, 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 not even a little bit political. Not even a little bit. You better pray for whoever's up there because God's got his hand on them. Oh, listen now. He said, I, he said, I set thrones up. And I take thrones down. Well, we don't like that too much. There's been quite a bit of this we ain't like too much. But that don't mean it ain't true. And let me tell you something beautiful. You don't have to like it. But you better take them handouts home, and you better take that book home, and you better get the Bible out, and you better get on your knees and say, Lord, help me to know what I need to do. I'm going to suggest this. As you grow, the closer you get to the top of the mountain, the pressure from the potter's hands is going to be less and less pleasing to you. Because the perfection has become specific rather than general. Look at here. Often, 
when we sit under a corrupt leader or an unrighteous leader, preacher, boss, government, doesn't make any difference. The necessary question we have to ask ourselves is, do we really believe God's in control? Do we really believe God can protect this church, our job, our home, etc., from a corrupt leader? Do we really believe God can take care of things? Are we uncomfortable right now? Hannah promised to dedicate her son to the Lord. Oh, Lord, I need you right now. This has got to come out. Hannah couldn't have a baby. Her husband's other wife could. Few of them. She made fun of Hannah all the time. When they went to eat, the husband tried to make, give, give Hannah a good portion of the food. And he tried to, you know, make up for the fact that she couldn't have a baby. But then the other wife kept making fun of her. And Hannah got down to business with God. Because there are places in God that only your enemy can drive you to. And she told the Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Period. Brother Ronnie, she didn't say, I'll give him back to you when there's a better leader in place. She didn't say, I'll give him back to you when things are a little more suitable to me. She said, you give him to me when he's weaned, I'll give him back to you. Now hear me as I tell you this. God gave her a son. She called him Samuel. And it was to a tarnished priesthood that she trusted her son. Eli was blinded to the bodacious escapades and sins of his son, and they were many. They would cook the sacrifice, and they were only supposed to take part of it out. But Brother Shannon there was just scrapping it all up. There was a hook that they put in there and they pulled it out and whatever was on the hook, Brother Billy, that was their portion. And these old boys were shoving everybody to the side and just taking a scoop shovel and scooping it all out saying, we're going to take it all. They were gorging on the sacrifice. Even though God had given them a portion, it wasn't enough. They were going to the door of the temple and the young ladies that would come there to worship, they were taking them and fornicating with them. It was to that Fine little place this, this uh, Mama Hannah turned her son over to. Don't you ever, ever, ever be guilty of underestimating the power of God or the divine will of God on somebody's life. And certainly don't measure it by who they come up under. Woo, I feel it. I feel it. Because look at here. Eli himself was grossly overweight. And in poor physical and spiritual health. And the pat response to any of us before this lesson, serving under such a leader would be to say, I can't stay under such a person. I can't serve under such a person. Now y'all know I, I, that, that this is the chapter in the book that came up next, don't you? This ain't me making this stuff up, don't you? Okay. I tell you when it's from me, this ain't. This is from the Lord. We would say, I'm leaving. I'm not sitting under such a leader. And we would make sure that everybody that was around us knew why we were leaving on our way out the door. First Samuel 3 and 1, first part. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. This was the place that God had determined to place Samuel. And Samuel embraced it. He came to the understanding that God is not blind, that he is just, and that he's able to take care of his own. Oh, I don't think y'all buying what I'm selling right now. Y'all understand that this young fellow was weaned from his mama probably about age three. 
and brought into a corrupt temple. And he was in the will of God. Why? He grew up holy. He grew up godly. He grew up the seer, the last of the judges, and the first of the prophets, if you will. The one God chose to anoint, not the first king, but also the second king of Israel. He was connected to God such as nobody else in the world was at that time. What does that say, Brother Shannon? That says over the years, there's been a lot of stuff that we stuck our nose in that we didn't have no business being in. We should have just trusted God. Oh, man. That dog will hunt. Hear me right now. We have not learned to what extent God needs our help and he doesn't. But I have to do something. God's not pleased with what's happening. Really what we're saying is God's not dealing with that to suit me. I'm going to be God in this situation. Church and otherwise. Don't let it be said that the Holy Ghost filled person is a rabble rouser at the workplace. Don't be going around talking about everybody and everything. You change your boss by praying. I knew it was going to be rough, but I ain't scared. How much time I got? Only got about 15 more minutes to suffer. Or maybe y'all only got about 15 more minutes to suffer. Churches are not cafeterias. In today's cultures, people leave churches, leave jobs, leave everything. I heard it yesterday of a man, he bought a new business, hired four new employees, all four of them quit in the first week. They go somewhere else. Easy come, easy go. That's the world we live in now. At the church, people just got all kinds of reasons why they want to leave. I said this the other day. None of them are. Nobody ever said, God has just blessed me so much I can't take it no more. God has just opened up the windows of heaven. We're having such good church. I feel his presence so much. He's moving through me so much. I got to go somewhere else. It's always I'm mad at somebody or something or God didn't come through for me like I wanted him to. Look at here. I'm not getting fed. They don't sing the songs I like. Preaching's too long. Preaching's too short. Don't believe people be saying that around here. But we got a couple. Don't you think for a second we don't. They focus too much on the new people and I don't feel valued here. They just forgot us. Sing too many songs. Worship's too long. Here we go. They're using people that I don't think got any business being used. So I'm going to go somewhere else. Am I doing all right, Brother Terrence? I'm glad you're on my side. I about forgot to shake hands with him earlier, and he near about got offended. <laughs> Rather than looking at the situation prayerfully and objectively, automatically decide we got to go somewhere where it's going to be better for me. Do you, have you not, have we not learned yet the perfecting process is not better for you as far as feelings go? It don't feel good. It don't feel good. Hear me. It, it didn't feel good for David to be sleeping in a cave when he belonged in the palace and he knew it. It didn't feel good for Joseph to be in prison or be in a pit when he knew he had a dream and he had a vision and he had the anointing of God on his life. It didn't feel good. But God was making them exactly what they needed to be. You think we're better than that? You think in a, in a movement, the apostolic movement, there are more people every day Every day being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost than there was on the day of Pentecost. Worldwide, there are more people being filled with the Holy Ghost every day than there were on the day of Pentecost. Worldwide, it's the greatest revival. Look it up on any medium. The Pentecostal movement 
And that is people that believe you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and the operation of the gifts. Not just UPC. The Pentecostal movement is the fastest growing movement in the world. Amen. Trust me, it is. You think there ain't going to be a bunch of problems with that many people coming in? You think God's going to trust us with a mighty revival, Brother Blake, if we can't get this stuff right? I tried to tell you before, going to be some people come in here that you're the Hatfields and they're the McCoys. There's going to be some people come in here you've done bad deals with back in the day. There's going to be people dancing with your girlfriend at the club back in the day. And there are going to be leaders that are going to do things that you don't like. And one of them probably going to be me. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Rather than looking at the situation prayerfully and objectively, we decide to go to a place where we perceive it to be better for us. And alas, it often is not, and the process is repeated. Now, I'm going to qualify something real quickly. There is a difference. There is a difference in church hopping and pursuing truth. <laughs> there is a difference. If you're in pursuit of truth and you're in pursuit of more of God on a personal level, God will put you right where he wants you. Ain't that right, Miss Jane? Okay. Ain't that right, Sister Sheila? Huh? Ain't that right, Ron, Don, Juan? You know what? I believe the Lord will do everything he promised to do. And I believe we're coming to a place where we're going to be ah, in so much alignment with him that we're just conduits of his authority and his anointing and his blessings uh, and the spirit of God flowing through us. Uh, but this is an area we're going to have to get it right in. Do we trust God or not? Do we believe in God or not? Or do we think he needs our help? Churches aren't cafeterias. But John Bevere says in his book, I've had numerous opportunities to be offended at leadership, most of which stemmed from my own fault or immaturity. He said that, not me, but I can relate. I had the chance to become critical and judgmental of leadership, but leaving wasn't the answer. In the midst of a very trying circumstance, one day the Lord spoke to me through a scripture verse and said, this is the way I want you to lead. Isaiah 55 and 12. It's a solid principle for leaving anything. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. One of the greatest tricks the enemy works against pastors especially, but against everybody, is to tell you they're not listening to you no more, that you're not ministering to them no more. You just will go somewhere else. And I had a man of God come by here and told me in a season of that in my life, and I have them sometimes every week. Not so much anymore, but I have. man of God came by here and he said, I want you to know something, Pastor Keen. He said, when God gets through with you in New Madrid, it won't be because you're upset or offended or because things go wrong. He said, it'll be because God has opened the door somewhere else. So get out of your mind that the situation is going to determine the will of God for you. Most don't leave with joy and led with peace. They consider the church a cafeteria from which they can pick and choose what they like and what they don't like. Now, I'm about to cause a little trouble, but you ready? We do not have the privilege of choosing where we want to worship and attend church. 
God decides that for us. My dad once, when he first said it, it kind of hurt my feelings. I didn't understand it. But people put on a church sign, and I've seen it often, see it on Facebook. This Sunday, attend the church of your choice. Exactly how does that line up with the Bible? Find the one that's a good fit for you. The one where they do the same thing, have the same club options that you like. We don't, do you believe that? We don't have the privilege? Some of them are scared to say amen. They don't know if they believe it or not. But let's see what the word says. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Sometimes it pleases God to have us in the body where we feel like nobody likes us, where we feel like we're, we don't like anything. Sometimes... Being pleasing to God means being displeased with everything else. <laughs> I'm probably going to have somebody else dismissed tonight. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. And he kept on, and that few weeks later, he said it again about, you know, worshiping God and being, you know, praising the Lord. And he said, I know I sound Pentecostal. And then my sister had said to me, Greg, you've gone from Catholic and now you're going to go right to the next thing we know, you'll be Pentecostal. <laughs> That's great. That's great. But the Bible says very clearly the Spirit will lead and guide you in all truth. But he won't lead you and guide you with a critical, ugly, judgmental spirit. He won't lead you to truth telling you you hate everybody you're leaving. He won't lead, lead you in the Spirit talking bad about everybody around you. Oh, Lord. Acts 17, 24 to 26. God that made the world and all things therein. That's you and me too. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Sister Heidi put up there earlier something about worship is just me giving my breath back to God. I really like that. That's true. Look at here. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. You're supposed to live where God wants you to. You're supposed to go to school where God wants you to. You're supposed to go to work where God wants you to. And you're supposed to go to church where God wants you to. You're supposed to buy a car where God wants you to. You're supposed to be in the neighborhood God wants you in. Glory. Brother Cody, some of us don't know if we like that too good. You know, some people are getting a little nervous. I just don't know if I want God that involved in my life. Because I like doing things my way. Well, let me tell you something, honey. We better get with the program or we're going to get left. Right. We're going to get in trouble like that every time. It's a mess. Every time I didn't, it's a mess. And when I was younger, like 48 and 7 months, 
I have because I ain't I ain't as tough today as I was a month ago. I'm better today than I was a month ago. I believe, yes, I am. I'm better today than I was last week. Does everybody get the word? The framework of your life is established by God, not by you. And what do you think happens when we get out of the will of God? We begin into the will of the devil. We get into the will of the flesh. The will of the flesh and the will of the devil look the same, feel the same, and act the same. And we're no longer in the will of God. Look, if we're in a position God wants us, are you ready for this? If we are planted where God wants us to be planted, by his very nature, the enemy has an obligation to uproot us. Can I say that again? If we're planted where God wants us, the enemy, by his very nature, has an obligation to try to uproot us. You with me on that? That's going to be his business to try to get us out of where God wants us. How do you think that looks and feels? He don't come to you telling you you're in the greatest place you've ever been in your life. If God wants you there, it's the enemy's business to get you out of there. If God wants you there, it's the enemy's business to get you out of there. Got it? The enemy's going to try to work to get you doing everything opposite of what God wants in your life. Okay, that's why I'm telling you, the enemy will let us dance and shout and talk in tongues and shout your hair down, bobby pins everywhere, run the aisles all the time as long as we're not growing, as long as we're not getting better. And you know what he'll make us think, Brother Cody? We had a shout down service last week. My, we're having revival. Ain't nobody new coming. I ain't baptizing nobody. Nobody getting filled with the Holy Ghost, but I like it. Yeah. Woo, boy, I like going to church. If we refuse to budge at the provocation of the enemy, we frustrate his plans and, in effect, render him powerless as we submit to the will of God. Why? Because authority runs downhill. And if I am under authority then I have authority. But if I'm not under authority, I have no authority. And why in the world do you think people are constantly coming and saying, ain't nothing going right in my life. I'm losing it, everything. Well, what God say? I don't know. I don't even have strength to pray. <laughs> well, my wife posted something on Facebook earlier this week about when the weight gets you smashed down, just start worshiping God on the floor. Brother Larry told us, oh, I feel Jesus, man. Well, I'm having fun tonight. This, Brother Larry told us, I am persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Persuaded. When you get persuaded, you know what that looks like? Planted. It looks like don't come over that line. I drew a line right there. I ain't going past it. I ain't going past it. And we learned Sunday. If he wants to come mess with me, you know what I got to do? Just take him to the presence of the Lord with me. And you know how I do that? I pick up one foot and I pick up the other foot and I pick up another foot and I begin to lift my hands and I begin to rejoice in the Holy Ghost and I rejoice in the Lord always. And the enemy can do one of two things. Leave me alone or worship with me. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Yep. So I remember laying back in the back in the nursery. I knew the carpet smelled like I cried all the way, laying on my stomach in the floor in the nursery, being the uh-huh. thing that I thought it was in the dark. And I thought, if I could just get there, I'm gonna be okay. Yep, yep, but yep. It was that. I really was worshiping the Lord God. Oh Lord. my goodness, Sister Maria. Now I know this is the Holy Ghost. I was sitting over there a while ago, and I left my iPad in there, and I couldn't find the scripture in my Bible because the concordance is not all that good. But I promise to goodness, halfway through worship, the scripture came to my mind. As the heart panteth after the brook, so does my soul pant after you, long after you, because I felt that spirit in here. That same thing that you just said a while ago, I felt that in here tonight. It's like a man coming out of the desert. That's what it felt like in this place tonight. And the Lord did not disappoint. It's like coming out of here hungry and thirsty and the windows of heaven opened up. And they said, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he healed me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost. It was like I just started getting filled filled up. It was like the Holy Ghost just said, I'm with you. I've got exactly what you need. I'm in you. You're with me and I'm with you and everything's going to be all right if I get in the presence of the Lord. Because in his presence there's fullness of joy. And at his right hand there's pleasures forevermore. I felt that right in the middle. I tried to find it while we was praying the offering prayer. That was David. As the deer pants after the brook. Oh, well, the only thing better than talking about heaven is when I walk on streets of gold and I wear that long white robe. I'm going to meet my Lord up there at that meeting in the air. Ain't nothing better than being there short of being in his presence. Oh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. All right. When the pastor brings something, I'm going to get us out of here in about five minutes. When the pastor brings something to the church, that's me, in case you didn't know. (laughs) When the pastor brings something to the church, he's had time to assimilate it, prayed and fasted over it, and fine-tune it to align with the will of God. How can we believe that we're qualified to make a lasting judgment on the same thing the first time we hear it. Brother Parkey corrected me on that one time. He said, GL, you've had that in the crock pot for a few weeks. You share it with them the first time and you want them to get it just like you got it. And it don't work that way. But Brother Shannon, the It works on the opposite end, too. We'll decide we don't like it. Stupid idea. Hate it. They don't ever do anything I want around here. Then come up with that stupid stuff. 30 seconds after you heard it, you done formed a judgment about it. The pause came back. The pause came back. Because here's the deal. And I feel this with every bit of confidence in my heart. I get out of the will of God. I turn into a lunatic. He's going to get me out of here. I don't bring you nothing. This carpet, prayed and fasted over it. Them chairs, prayed and fasted over it. Everything, everything. Name change, prayed and fasted over it. Sought counsel over it. But we heard it. We made a decision whether it was right or wrong as soon as we heard it. And when it didn't line up with what we wanted, we got offended. Can I get an amen? Amen. When we don't agree, we make it personal. And then we make it spiritual. Because we know that God puts everything into our ear first. 
and we're not really fasting and we're not really praying and we're hit and miss to the house of God and we got all kinds of crazy stuff going on with our giving, but I know the will of God. And that ain't it. And I'm mad. And I don't care who knows it. Y'all understand that ain't got no place in a revival church. But let me tell you what we need to learn to do. We need to learn how to disagree and still be friends. We need to learn how to disagree and still be on the same team. It ain't a competition. It ain't a competition. Let me tell you something. This is going to come as a surprise to you. I ain't right all the time. But let me tell you something, Brother Shannon. I've learned that the Lord will give me just a little bit of room. And then he said, sit down right there, just like my daddy used to do. Sit down right there and look at me, boy. I said, look at me, boy. And then he says, we got out of line right there. Why we get men in our life that we're subject to, Sister Maria? Sometimes people wonder, why do you talk to this one? Why do you talk to that one? Because the Bible says there's safety in the multitude of counselors. That's why. The Bible says I have to be in submission to those that are over me. Know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. That's the Bible. Oh, we're going somewhere, folks. John Bevere did this and very quickly corrected by God. He left his church. He was gone four months and he realized real fast, quick and in a hurry. God didn't tell me to do this. I told me to do this. If God isn't saying anything, don't do anything. One month after returning, John Bevere repented, reconciled, and the relationship between him and his pastor was strengthened. And that's the purpose of this teaching. Being offended doesn't have to be forever. We can get it right. We can get it fixed, and we can give God a new avenue where to work. And that avenue is called us because it wasn't us. It was me and thee, but it became us because we got everything worked out. Let's stand. I didn't get finished, but I'll just finish this and do the next chapter. It ties in. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for, I saw several brought their book. Um, I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't have this book. Um, we had more than one person buy extra and give them out. And uh, it's not the Bible, but it's Bible-based. And it hit me right between the eyes. Feel a little bit of opposition, a little bit of discomfort. But let me tell you what to do with it. Are you ready? Go home. Get your crock pot out of the closet. Take the lid off. Add a gallon of water. Put the lid on. Turn it on. And get on your face before God and let him talk to you. Let me tell you what's going to surprise you. You know what he's going to tell you? Same thing I've been saying. You want to know why? Because I put it in the crock pot before I brought it. I saw it after the Lord. I read it on my own time. And then I come into the house of God and I spent nearly the whole day here today making sure I'm in the will of God. You know why, Brother Blake? Because I don't want to be right. I want to have revival. I don't want to be the boss. I want to have revival. I don't want to be the only one, the only, you know, it only smoke if it's coming out of my chimney. No, 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 no. Pray with me. God, we love you. Thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for power. Thank you for authority. Thank you for chastisement. Thank you, God, that you love us so much and you have so much for us. I pray, Lord, that you let this be something that we gnaw on. Let it be, Lord, as it is. It's not milk. It's meat. It's meat, and it's going, we're going to have to get an appetite for it, and we're going to have to chew on it a little bit, and we're going to have to be able to assimilate it a little bit, but we want to be better. We want to have revival, and we want to take away all of these weapons the enemy's been able to use freely for so long, the power of offense, the bait of offense, and, and having it our way, and being led by the flesh and not by the spirit. Get us in line, Lord. That's what we're asking for. That's what we're asking for. We submit ourselves to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Sunday morning at 10, we're going to have elements. Sunday at 11, we're going to have worship service. Going to be throw down church. This is Christmas Sunday. We do have a small gift for everybody. And uh, if you, if you, uh, whatever you got going on, this is Christmas Sunday. And, uh, but then, Sister Michelle, we're going to have Christmas Sunday the next week, too. Ain't that right? Okay. And uh, going to be a lot of folks here the next couple of weeks. A lot of them belong here. Amen. Now, I don't, we went on the parade the other night, and I'm very grateful for that. Everybody that helped do the float and participated. But did y'all notice how many people we passed on the street should have been with us? I'm talking about used to be here. Yeah, Brother Ronnie said, that's what I'm talking about. Ronnie said, all of them supposed to be here. <laughs> Revival of the prodigal is on the way. It's on the way. And uh, uh, they'll be back quick. And let me tell you something. Don't get mad when God starts using them about as fast as they come back. They ain't on parole. They ain't on probation. They ain't got nothing to prove to us. He got the whole world in his hands. I just felt like singing that. Love y'all. Thank you for coming tonight. You're dismissed. And oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Sunday night at what time? Sweater party. Chips and dip and stuff. We still having that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, is it 6 o'clock? Yeah, ugly sweater party in the family center. Very informal. Chips and dips and, and just come have fun. Games and everything. Everybody's invited. Okay, old and young, rich and poor, boys and girls. Everybody's invited. Let's come have a fun time. Just a little church Christmas party. And then please share the service. And we're giving a prize out from now till March the 9th. We ain't going to give it out no more after that because I'm going to be broke. Okay? But we're going to give out a prize. But please share it. We're getting over five, almost 600 views of Sunday service. And that's double what we were getting because you share it. Share our services. Check in at the Riverbend Pentecostals. And what you, somebody else told me, Brother Ronnie told me, put at... Riverbend Pentecostals live when you check in. Is that right in your comments? And every time they click on it, it'll come to our service. All right? Let's use that. We've been gifted with it. Let's use social media. Now, see y'all Sunday.